Welcome to the uh, fourth installment of the information series. Um, this is Nick Cocker. He's the president of the Herpetological Society, and he'll be speaking to you about lizards tonight. Um, I've been out in the bush with him and his brother many a time, um, and Corey's looking for geckos, um, and other Corey's looking for skinks, and um, yeah, wealth of information, so you're in good hands. Here he is. <laughs> Hey guys, so as Jelan said, I'm, I'm Matt Parker, I'm the president of the Hypatological Society and I'm a consultant herpetologist based up in Auckland. So that basically means I work with and study lizards and they're a pretty uh, poorly known group. So hopefully you guys have picked something up from this talk and uh, know a bit more about them um, coming out of it. So yeah, I'm first going to talk briefly about lizards in general, what they are and how they fit into the animal kingdom. Then talk specifically a bit more about New Zealand lizards, why they're special and unique compared to other, other lizards around the world, the role they play in the New Zealand ecosystem, uh, then talk a little bit about their conservation status and the threats that they're facing, and also a little bit about how to find them, how you survey and monitor these cryptic little, little lizards in the wild. And um, then finish up with a little bit about uh, our local species of earthworm and how you can identify them. And then if we've got a little bit of time at the end, I brought a few lids along that we can have uh, a look at. So we'll try to zoom through this so we can check out some cool lizards. Alright, so lizards. They're a reptile. So there's actually four classes of reptiles. We've got the crocodile and the alligators and the order crocodilia. Is the order closely related. Um, and many of you will be aware that we've also got the Tuatara in New Zealand, but these guys aren't actually a lizard. They're an entirely separate group of their own called the Rhynchocephalia, which are the beak headed reptiles. And they're a really ancient group. They uh, emerged in the early Triassic before dinosaurs even appeared on the earth. And um, they're really cool. They look like a lizard, but they're not one, so we're not going to talk about these guys today. So lizards are usually tetrapod, so that means they've got four legs, but as usual there's an exception to the rule. Um, so you do have some species overseas of legless lizards, but all the ones that we can find in New Zealand have four legs. Um, and they're different to amphibians, because rather than having this sensitive, soft, permeable skin, they've got a keratinous um, outer layer of skin or scales which uh, helps them retain moisture, uh, which is quite important and allows them to live in quite harsh environments that a lot of animals otherwise wouldn't be able to live in. Um, and they're also a pectifer. So that's just a fancier name for cold-blooded. And cold-blooded isn't a particularly good description of that because ectifer means that they just get their warmth from the environment. So their whole metabolism and uh, temperature is regulated by the sun. Um, as endotherms, humans and mammals, produce their own body heat. Whereas these guys, like the Sotago stick, they'll wake up in the morning when it's really cold, they'll come out and sit on the rock in the sun and warm up. And then when they're getting a bit too hot, they'll rush out down into this little crack and cool down a bit and just shuffle between the rock and the shade to regulate his own temperature. And the benefit of this is that they can be quite efficient in terms of their energy. They're not able to produce their own body heat. So it means they don't need to eat a lot. And in winter when it's really cold, they don't actually need to eat anything at all for several months, which is quite cold. <laughs> Talking about New Zealand lizards in particular, so we don't have the diversity of lizards that you see overseas, like the iguanas and chameleons and marsh lizards, but we do have um, geckos and skinks. So these two guys up here are geckos, the striped gecko and the jungle gecko. And these are stamps, the speckled stamp, and this is a green stamp. So you can't use colour to tell the difference between geckos and stamps. You can get green stamps and green geckos, and browny orange geckos and browny orange stamps. And while we don't have a huge diversity of types of lizards, we've got a huge number of species. 120 for a relatively small country such as New Zealand which is actually the highest diversity per area for any temperate region in the world. So it's quite quite a, quite a unique lizard fauna. 
Um, so we've got seven different genus of geckos, and one genus of skinks, but within that huge diversity of colours and patterns that you can see here. And it all depends on what environment the animals are living in. So this guy here, the striped gecko, he'd be living in things like flax, where stripes can help him blend in. The green geckos would be living in um, sort of shrubs and trees, so green helps them blend in. And these guys would be living in sort of drier, um, arid environments, so that brown sort of colour helps them blend in with dry grass. And these guys would be in the gullies, which is a bit, bit uh, damper, so the green coloration helps them blend in to where they live. Um, but yeah, why so many? Um, so the current theory is that New Zealand's past history of glaciation split the country up into a series of kind of different regions and you get a different group of lizards evolving in each separate part and that's why we've ended up with so many. Um, and yeah, quite a, quite a huge diversity for a small uh, country like ours. So geckos and skinks, how do you tell them apart? Uh, these guys are the skinks, these are the geckos. What you'll notice straight away is that the geckos have quite a big head and a distinctive neck. They've got these big limbs too, uh, to walk around, whereas the skinks have got a kind of head that blends into the rest of their body. They're kind of sleek and smooth, almost like a, like a snake with legs. Um, another difference between them is that skinks blink and geckos don't. So the skink over here, the robust skink, you can see he's got some eyelids, he can blink, um, but his eyes are getting a little bit dry. So the geckos don't blink at all. They've got a transparent scale that covers your eye and it's always open. And when it gets dirty, they've got this big fleshy tongue which they poke around and um, lick it clean. Which is quite cool. <laughs> yeah. The scales are also quite different between the two. So you'll notice that this skink looks quite glossy. It's because he's got these smooth, sort of fish like scales that are overlapping. Whereas the gecko, you've got quite a baggy skin that's really soft. Um, and the last difference in the feet, which is quite interesting, the um, skinks have these little feet with long skinny toes and claws for basically climbing over, over rocks and things. But geckos, as many of you will know, they have these big wide toes with these specialised scales underneath. And so these scales here, you can see the little lines, they're called lamellae on the feet. And each of those is covered in thousands of tiny little hairs which increases the surface area of the foot so they can climb up smooth surfaces. And if New Zealand geckos don't have as developed um, sort of uh, setae or hairs on their feet as other geckos, but if they take it slow, they can climb up a vertical pane of glass, which is quite impressive when you see that. What makes New Zealand lizards special? So they've evolved in a really cold climate. New Zealand um, is pretty, um, pretty mild today, but previously it's gone through ice ages. It's obviously at the bottom of the world. So it evolved in this really cold climate, and it means that they've developed these really uh, unique features. So like I said, lizards are ectotherms. They rely on the external environment to regulate their metabolism. So with those colder temperatures, we've slowed down everything. Your whole life history is a lot slower than reptiles overseas. So they've reached maturity at a later date. Most geckos and skinks around the world will take a year or six months to reach maturity. Our geckos can take up to eight years. Um, and the reproduction rate is also much, much lower. So most, most lizards overseas will breed multiple times a year, whereas some of our species only breed once every two years, and the geckos can only have two babies once a year at maximum. Um, and their longevity, their lifespan is just extended so much. Most geckos around the world will only live for five years, whereas ours have been recorded living up to 50 and older, which are the oldest, longest living geckos in the world. So this guy right here, he's a Waitaha gecko. He's a little island off Canterbury, where they've been monitoring these geckos for about 60 years, I think. And there was one found out there few years ago, which had been marked by a scientist in the early 1960s, so it was at least 53 years old when it was last found, um, and it could be potentially older than that, because I don't know how old it was when it was marked. Um, 
And the last thing that's really, really interesting about them is their mode of reproduction. Most lizards around the world, they eat, but ours, all of them except for one, give birth to live young. So this, this uh, Wellington green gecko here, she'll breed once a year, and she has two baby geckos, about that size, quite big, um, and they pop out, sort of ready to go. She carries them around with her for about eight months, I think, they're, um, before they're born. And um, this has a, it's a, basically a strategy for living in a colder climate, because if you lay eggs, you're leaving them to the mercy of the environment around you, like if it gets too cold, the eggs might die. Whereas if, you're, if you carry around your babies inside you, you can go and bask in the sun to warm them up. And um, yeah, it's a, quite a cool thing that not many geckos do. In fact, ours are the only geckos in the world, far one in New Caledonia, that give birth to our young like that. And this is our, um, this is our only egg laying lizard, the aptly named egg laying stink, which is quite an interesting species that I'll talk about in a little while. So yeah, where do they live? Where can you find them? We can find them pretty much everywhere you'd expect and also in some places that you wouldn't. So you find them on the coast, in uh, sand dunes, this is a shore sink, out at um, Tuparanui on the Auckland East Coast. You can find them on rocky cliff places, so this is a log Harwagi cove here. These guys live um, in little rock cracks and cliffs and under boulders. And you can also find them right down on the high tide line. So this is the egg laying or shooter sink that I talked about before. And they've taken living in a coastal ecosystem to the sort of max basically. These guys, they come out at night um, and dive into rock pools to catch crabs and shrimp underwater. And they can hold their breath for 20 minutes underwater. And um, they've got the, obviously living in a really salty environment, it's quite harsh. Um, so develop this interesting strategy where they excrete salt through their nostrils. They basically sneeze it out when it builds up too high. But yeah, really, really cool species. Um, yeah, yeah, not many skinks do that. You also find them in the forest. So this is a Dugas gecko living in some mature forest. You can also find them in scrub, like this Northland Green Gecko. She's living in a patch of Karnika. And you can also find them on the forest floor. These are robust skinks that lives in leaf litter and under rocks and logs uh, during the day and it comes out at night to hunt winter. You can find them in gardens, in urban areas. So these two are the copper and ornate skin. These guys will live in rank grass, so like long grass and um, untidy gardens around Auckland. And here's a bunch of native geckos living on the roof of someone's sheep down in Wellington. So yeah, you can pretty much find them anywhere, but somewhere you wouldn't expect is right up in the alpine zone. So these guys, the black-eyed gecko, orange-spotted gecko, and the barrier skin, all live right up in the alpine zone. They only live there and their habitat is covered with snow for half of the year, which is crazy for a, a, an ectoperm trying to you know, use the environment to regulate its temperature. This guy here is even sitting out right next to a patch of ice, which is pretty weird. So yeah, there's geckos and skinks everywhere. Um, and they have quite an important role in the ecosystem. So they're obviously predators, feeding a lot of little invertebrates, so cockroaches and spiders and, uh, and wetter crickets, all sorts of little creepy crawlies. They also prey for um, a lot of our native bird species, so moorpork, wicker, kiwi, taika has been reported eating them. So Tara are pretty voracious lizard predators. And interestingly enough, they're also scavengers, so skinks are notorious, they're kind of like the forest garbage disposal, they find anything disgusting on the ground, it's rotting and dying to eat it. Um, and also in seabird colonies, there's a couple of species of geckos and skinks that will wait around in a, um, a seabird burrow or in a gannet colony for a parent bird to come back to feed its chick. And then when they regurgitate fish to feed their chick, anything that spills out, these geckos will rush out and grab it and then come back and hide. Um, 
And yeah, it's kind of interesting how they adapt to these different, different things that are going on. But um, more importantly, they can be quite important pollinators. So for species like Fuzikawa, Kanaka, Manaka, Hebe, that, um, they, they've got a real sweet tooth, so they like to go for nectar. So this guy here, he's a rock colour, you know, that was on Tiri Tiri Matangi Island. And what they do is when the Fuzikawa are flowering, they go out at night and they stick their head into the base of the flower where it's heaped of nectar. And they get their face absolutely covered in pollen. You can see it's all up in his nostril, all over his snout there. And then we'll go to the next flower and they'll pollinate them, moving from flower to flower. And um, they actually reckon that Furukawa might have specifically evolved to be pollinated by a keeper. Um, and they can also be quite important seeker species. So, yeah, they eat quite a lot of fruit. In the wild, Cosmo and Mahali fruit. And this one here is quite interesting. I'm not sure whether you're familiar with this one. This is a porcupine plant down in the South Island. So they've got these little white berries that grow on the bottoms of the branches. And white obviously isn't a bright colour that birds would like to go for. And they're held at the bottom of the plant. So they're designed specifically for lizards to come from underneath and eat them. And then the lizard will eat the fruit walk away, play in a rock crack somewhere and poop the seed out and then the lizard, the, um, the seed will obviously germinate and grow from that. Um, and this is all very well, um, but how important could a few lizards be? It's kind of hard to, hard to picture them having a massive impact when you, you don't see many around, they seem to be quite rare. Um, but if you go out to some islands that find the predators, they're everywhere. So this was, this was one bait station on Whale Island and there were about 40 people living there. You go out to these places and there's lizards everywhere. You have to watch out where you're walking that you don't stomp on them. They're all over the ground, all over the trees at night. This is on one of the Mercury Islands off the Coromandel where you've got about 20, 20 geckos there all over the tree going for honeydew. Um, and you can just imagine, just by the sheer abundance of them, what an impact they might have been having on, in terms of pollination and seed dispersal that we just don't see on the mainland now. And so why aren't they around? 80% um, of our lizards are at risk of threatened, and the reasons why are pretty much the same, same reasons uh, that biodiversity is threatened around the world. Invasive species, so things like rats and cats and stoats, um, even mice will eat lizards. Um, and the reason that these guys are having such a, such a bad impact on them is because our lizards evolved in a New Zealand that only had birds as predators. When you're a bird, you're flying around, you're looking for things to eat. So if you're a lizard and you see a bird coming by, you sit still and you rely on your camouflage and the bird probably won't see you and you just fly past. If you're a rat or a mouse, you're using scent to hunt for things. So when a gecko sees a rat approaching and it thinks, oh, I can just sit still, you know, this thing won't see me, the rat's like, it's a sit duck, it's an easy meal, the rat just comes along and munches it. And so, yeah, we're losing, losing animals all the time um, from rats and cats and stoats that are predating them. Um, also, habitat destruction is another major one. So, removal of habitat for housing development and mining um, is continually taking away habitat and also fragmenting the habitat that, that is there so that lizard populations can't meet up and, um, and interbreed, I guess. There's a, there's a worry that in small patches like this, you might um, end up with too small a number of geckos in there that, that end up getting inbreeding kind of fizzling out over time. Um, another one which has had a little bit of media attention recently is poaching. So some of you might recall a few years ago um, stories about um, European uh, citizens coming to New Zealand and trying to smuggle jewel geckos out in their undies. There's been a few stories like that where people come over and they grab a few and, and uh, yeah, try to smuggle them out. 
but it's probably more of a threat to small populations. These two more invasive species have had a bit of structure and probably even more of an impact. But um, yeah, it's definitely more of an animal welfare issue. If, you, if you've got lizards stuffed in your undies, it's not comfortable. <laughs> yeah. What are they the worth on the black market? Uh, so these guys, I think, 20,000 for a size. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they're quite rare and they breed very slowly. So if people want them, I mean, they're very cute. Pretty stunning. Yeah, very cute. They always like the smiling types. But yeah, the other one that hasn't had much attention is climate change. And um, I feel like we haven't really seen the full impact of that yet, but there's a couple of examples out here. <coughs> this guy here, this is a cobblestone. So this is another one that's been in the media a little bit recently. So we know that climate change is going to have an impact on the frequency of severe storms. These guys, in the early 2007, living in a tiny patch of habitat behind the pub in Granity on the west coast. This tiny patch of cobble, and there were about 200 there at the time, I think. But they were only in a specific little habitat, and they would have been there for thousands of years. Um, but it was eroding away slowly. Um, in 2015, they realised that this was a critically endangered species, and in 2016, after already being battered by several storms, there was an impending cyclone that threatened to wipe out their entire habitat. So basically, they, they got together a team of herpetologists, they went to this site and caught as many as they could find. The storm came through and wiped out their entire habitat, none of it is left. And now there's a small population of 40 of them living at Auckland Zoo. And they're kind of a bit of a climate change refugee, they're not really sure what to do with them because there's no way to put them back into the wild now. Um, and there's a lot of species that are in the same boat. If we have more storms like this, it's possible that we might have a few others like the cobble skunk, which are going to have to you know, survive only in captivity. So we're going to have to find some new places for them. This is another interesting one. This is the orange spotted gecko that I talked about before. So these guys only live in the alpine zone above 1,600 metres. Um, so their habitat is covered in snow for half the year, they breed really slowly, they um, reach maturity really slowly, um, and we think they probably lived uh, in the lowland areas too, um, historically. Why are they up the top of these mountains? It's because it's so cold at the top there that mice and rats can't survive, but with climate change, rats and mice are going to be able to reach these, these few remaining spots where this, these geckos are living and we could potentially lose them if, if nothing's done to control those predators. So what are our most vulnerable species? Um, the ones most vulnerable to predators and the ones that we're missing on the mainland now are the large terrestrial and nocturnal ones. So if you're a big fat lizard like these Robust Negrias and Whitaker's skinks. You can't hide from a mouse or a rat because you're about the same size. You can't squeeze into a hole where they can't get you. If you're terrestrial, you're living on the ground, you can't climb away from rats and mice and hedgehogs that are going to eat you. And if you're nocturnal, you're active at the same time mice and rats are hunting. So these guys down here are all of these. These big, fat, chubby skinks that can't climb very well, they've got little feet all come out at night and these would have been the first species to disappear from the mainland of New Zealand and they're now only found on islands that have never had rats or mice on them. These two are starved because these are interesting. Uh, this is the Duvacellus before Chevron stick. So these are both very big lizards. But this guy is quite good at climbing trees, the Duvacellus before. And the Chevron skink, even though he lives on the ground, is active during the day. So just by the fact that this guy can climb trees and this guy's active at a different time to mites and rats, they can still hang on in very low numbers, whereas these guys are toast. On to more rosy things. How do you find them? How do you monitor them? So there's a few different methods that you can use. Um, artificial refuges, you can use tracking tunnels. Um, those are fairly passive. 
uh, methods, or you can do hand searching, like you might have done as a kid, sort of turning over rocks and rolls with the stamps. Um, and then you can also use um, visual searching, so you basically just go out and look for them, which is pretty tricky for these things to design, not for these things. Um, you can also track for them, uh, but that's only really done in very specific sort of circumstances. Um, These are a couple of artificial refugees. So this is what we call an ACO, an artificial proper object. And it basically mimics kind of like a rock or a piece of debris on the ground that sets of geckos might live in. And you leave this out in the field for a few months and then you come back and turn it over and see if there's any little wriggly things that are living in it. Um, and they work quite well for skanks, but they didn't work well for arboreal geckos. So this was something that was developed around 2010. This is called a, a cell phone cover, which is basically a piece of foam wrapped around a tree. And it mimics a loose piece of bark, and you'll get these little arboreal geckos to like to use it. And again, you kind of just leave this out in the field for a while, and the idea is that geckos find it and start living in it. And it's, a, um, it's a reasonably reliable way to protect them. Um, it's pretty much no better way. You can also use tracking tunnels, so you guys might be familiar with these for tracking rats and mice. You can also use them for geckos and skinks. You just take advantage of the fact that these guys have a real sweet tooth. So they go for anything that's really sweet and stinky, a piece of banana or pear, you stick it in the middle of the head and then come back a few days later and you get a little hip from it. So this here is a this here is a roll kawa gecko. And the interesting thing here is you can tell based on the shape of the feet and the number of little lines that you see on the, um, on the toes, which species of gecko it is, because they've all got different numbers of lamellae on their toes. Or you can search for them. So these are fairly easy. I, I struggled to find some that were quite hard. This is what it's like searching for Canterbury Scree Scents up in the um, Canterbury High Country. So you're basically looking for a little head that's popping out of a crack looking at you. And there he is right there. Uh, this is what it's like looking for green geckos during the day. Uh, you're basically walking along, scanning the foliage, looking for any little body part that might be sticking out. And so she's in there somewhere, this is a manuka gecko. And then you can see her tail sticking out there. It's fairly obvious in this picture that she was six metres up when we found her. So you can look for geckos at night. This is another method that we use, is spotlighting. Um, often during the day, uh, they're quite hard to spot, but at night, under a torch light, they stand out quite well. This is a forest geeker on Great Barrier Island, you can see sitting on the, sitting on the branch there. And then when you're looking for green geckos at night, they like this really dense foliage, and you're looking for this blob in the tree. If it's green, it's going to be a green gecko. and if it's grey, it's usually a forest gecko. That's a fairly obvious one. Just and yeah, that was this, this guy here, a little elegant gecko down the whole way. So when you're monitoring them, how do you know that you're whether you're seeing the same ones or different individuals? If you're doing it over a short amount of time, you can just mark them. So you get a, a non-toxic pen, you just write a little number on the back, and you can see there's a number two written on that one. So that would have been the second one that we found. And then we record it and turn them over. You can see that it was the second one that we caught. But in the longer term, what's really useful is that just like a fingerprint, every gecko has a different pattern. So it's not so much the colour that you pay attention to, but the pattern. So you can see with this, this girl here, she's got kind of two little fork markings here between the, and the markings between the front legs. This one here's got a little blob thing going on, it's not the same as this one. And a little zigzag thing here. And this one has a fairly sort of smooth pen shape there, but is otherwise very bland. And each gecko has its own pattern, which is like a fingerprint, so you can track them between years, even when long after this sort of thing would have worn off. This is in the Auckland area. So, 
just like I was talking about before, we would have had heaps where it would have had up to 20 different species of native lizards in the Auckland area before people arrived. But most of them are gone now. Of those 20, seven are now restricted entirely to islands, and five are regionally extinct, so don't occur in the Auckland region anymore. Um, we also have one introduced species, the rainbow plague scat, which most of you guys have probably seen. And we've got one Auckland endemic species that has recently been discovered, which is this guy here, the Murawai gecko, which only lives on the sand dunes out at Murawai. And it's currently nationally critical. There's a bit of work going into uh, trying to work out where they are and how many there are out there. So yeah, basically what we've got left with now, the ones you're likely to come across in the bush, and there's three species of geckos, the Owen gecko, forest gecko, and Pacific gecko, four species of native skinks, copper skink, or eight skink, and micro skink, and then this introduced species, the rainbow skink. And of course, we're missing, what we're missing are these big, big suckers, like the robust skink, all of our big geckos and skinks, and also these huge numbers of geckos and skinks that we used to have, which would have been pollinated plants and dispersing seeds. So these are the three geckos you might come across in the bush around Auckland. This guy here, the Ellen gecko, fairly easy to distinguish. They're usually this bright green colour or occasionally they can be yellow. Um, this one here is the forest gecko and the Pacific gecko. They're fairly similar in appearance. But probably the easiest way to tell them apart is the forest gecko has a zigzag pit that's down the back. Whereas these guys have big, big blotches on their back and quite often even if these aren't present, the patterns on the tail, these big blotches are a key, key way to tell them apart from the forest gecko. Does it have a different colored mouth? You know, like the forest gecko has an orange yep. mouth, but... Yeah, forest geckos usually have a sort of yellowy orange colored mouth. These guys are usually pink, but there can be a little bit of overlap sometimes. <laughs> but yeah, that's another good way to tell. But you, yeah. If the gecko, if the gecko barks at you or licks its eyes, then you can see the colour that's now. Otherwise, it's yeah, you're probably just going to see the pattern. But yeah. So a little bit more about them. This is the Elling gecko. So they're currently at risk and declining. So they're a lot less common now than they used to be. They're mainly living in scrub, so things like Kanaka and Maruka, and they really like red matapo too. Um, and they're really interesting because they're a diurnal gecko. Um, most geckos around the world are nocturnal, so only come at n out at night. But these guys are active during the day, sort of sitting around out, out of the scrub, eating flies that buzz past, and, and um, getting the nectar out of Monica and Kanaka. And yeah, about one in 50 are this interesting yellow color. So there's. Um, your genes code for two different pigments in the skin. So you have a yellow pigment and a blue pigment, which makes them turn green. This one here has a defective gene for blue pigment, so only the yellow is showing, and they call that xanthochroma. Um, and these guys are pretty, they're fairly rare in the wild, because you can see while this one turns up, this one sticks out like a sore thumb, and so it gets picked out pretty quickly by a magpie or, um, or a mine or something flying past that's looking for a meal. This is the forest gecko, uh, also at risk of climbing, um, so a lot less common than they used to be. Living in fairly similar habitat, but also will live in mature forests, not just scrub. And they're, um, these guys are nocturnal, but you quite often do see them out basking during the day. And um, they're quite quite a cool species because when they emerge from cover during the day they're often a very dark brown and then within a matter of minutes can change from a dark brown to this very light grey colour quite quickly. This is the last one, Pacific Gecko. Um, at risk relic, so they're not declining but they're a lot rarer than the forest gecko and the green gecko on the mainland. And that's because they spend a lot of time on the ground like this guy here. So they're a lot more vulnerable to those introduced predators. Um, they're living in fairly similar habitat to the forest gecko. Um, 
But in terms of their activity and behaviour, they're a lot more strictly nocturnal. So these guys, you won't see them basking during the day. And they're very, very hectic, very fast um, and nervous species. Um, they're notorious for dropping their tail. And sometimes you, all it takes is just shining a torch on them and they'll drop their tail, um, which is quite distressing. Um, also interesting with this one, I haven't continued to talk about it. You can see they've got these little red mites around the eyes. So it's, a, it's a gecko equivalent of fleas. It's kind of like these little red mites that, that, um, that live around the eyes and the, in the armpits and things like that. And they're specific to New Zealand geckos. These are our stinks that you might see in Auckland. So, these three are the ones you're probably more likely to see and they're all kind of similar looking. These two here, this is the mokro stink and the shore stink. Um, these are fairly conspicuous. This guy, the mokro stink, has got really interesting cool striping. So they're a grassland species. And the shore stink often have this grey speckling for living on sand dunes. Um, so I'll talk more about these guys. These are the ones you're likely to see around your garden and have a little bit of trouble distinguishing between them. So this is them. This is the copper stamp, the ornate stamp, and the clay stamp. This is the Aussie one. This is the uh, introduced species. So there's a few different ways to tell them apart. First is behaviour. The copper stamp. The ornate stink, the two native ones, are very, very secretive. They hardly ever come out of cover. Whereas the plague stink or the rainbow stink, they're really, really conspicuous. They're out fasting all the time, running around in the sun. So chances are if you see a skink in Auckland, it's going to be one of these guys. Um, the second way to tell native skinks from the plague stink is the scale on the head. So you kind of have to get quite close to see it. It's called the frontopyramidal scale. And it's this diamond shaped scale sort of the, in the middle of the head between the eyes. On the plague stink it's just a single diamond shaped scale. Whereas over here on the ornate stink, or all native stinks in fact, that's it there and it's split down the middle into two. And that's that's uh, probably the most um, reliable way to tell them apart. But another, an easier way is obviously the behaviour, but also the pattern on the lips is quite different between these three. So the, the copper stink is the denticulate pattern, which basically means it looks like skeleton teeth across the mouth there. The plague stink usually doesn't have any, and the ornate stink is this cool, what we call a teardrop under the eye. This little white white marking here with black edge. Um, and also, to a lesser degree, um, the belly colour is also quite distinctive, but obviously you have to catch it to see that. Copper stinks are the yellow belly, ornate stinks are the red belly, and clay stinks are the very silvery belly. So if you catch one and want to identify it, that's how you do it. So I'll finish with a little bit on clay stinks. Are they a threat? This is a question I get asked all the time. So these guys were introduced to Auckland in the 1960s. They were first seen at the Otahu Rail Yards, uh, which isn't, isn't too far from here. And they breed really quickly. They uh, reach huge densities. And now they've spread to most of the North Island. There's been some recent incursions to the Great Barrier. And now they've also reached the South Island in the last couple of years, which has been a bit of a worry. And they're, um, they're a lot smaller than our native species, but they can reach these huge densities. So there's been a worry that they might have the potential to outcompete native stinks. Um, but so far, the evidence to date doesn't show that they interact in any way negatively. You often find them living in exactly the same areas. Um, not re they don't, don't even seem to interact much. And if they do, usually the plague stink comes out second best because the bigger native stink sort of bully them off. Um, so yeah, there's no real evidence that they're competing with native species. Uh, there's been some other theories suggested that maybe the higher number of stinks around these plague stinks is increasing the number of predators for plague stinks and native lizards. Um, but again, there's no evidence that that, um, that is actually happening. Um, and then also there's the issue of how do you control or trap for them? 
anything that you use to try and poison or trap, control these guys, won't discriminate between the native stinks and the introduced stinks. So you're just going to end up um, yeah, having a negative impact on the native stinks. And these guys, even if you take out a few, because they breathe so quickly, they'll just bounce back. Um, so what should you do? Um, the current advice is basically don't do anything. Just make sure that if you're travelling to a peace-free island or somewhere in the country that doesn't have these, check your bag and make sure they're not in there. So what can you do to help? Um, peace control, really important, probably the most important thing. So getting rid of the mice and the cats and the rats and things that are eating your, our native lizards is, is um, crucial. Um, plant native species that produce berries and nectar that, that lizards like to eat. Or provide habitat, so the stinks are really like a dense ground cover. And the geckos are like um, a dense canopy, so things like carnivora and, and uh, red matterpah are really good. You can also create a lizard garden. So you could leave a messy corner in your garden that's full of rocks and logs and things from, that lizards will like to hide under. Um, and if you have a cat, you can consider keeping it inside at night, and that way it's not out there eating a wildlife. A little bit controversial <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> if you want uh, more information about native lizards, this is a really cool book. Uh, this just came out in 2018. It's, um, it's been completely updated. Uh, it's got almost all of our species in it, but there's new ones being found every year, so it's probably already due for an update. Um, if you don't want to go out and buy a book, is the New Zealand Meteorological Society website. You've got a bit of information up there about native lizards, what you can do to help them. Um, and the DOC website also has uh, a bit of information, not much. I'm a little bit biased to this one. <laughs> but, yeah, those things are pretty good. And yeah, thanks for listening. <laughs>